come on in. I'm Mary Davidson and it's our community and as usual I have somebody that is extremely interesting for you to meet today and her name is Dr. Lika Sridhar and she is Associate Professor of Horticultural Sciences, big mouthful, That's so <laughs> uh, Horticultural <laughs> Sciences at Johnson County Community <coughs> College and a person of um, well thought of in her profession, I would have to say, Lika. You mm -hmm. have lots of pages of published uh, scholarly work, and that is very commendable. Thank you. I need to ask you, though, you were very specific that you wanted to say horticultural sciences. Yes. And not just horticulture. No. <laughs> why did you, why were you? Because horticulture is an applied science. You're applying the principles of uh, biology, mm -hmm. botany, plant physiology, that's plant pathology, entomology, plant breeding, genetics, biochemistry, soil chemistry. So there's so many other, a lot of science is going in. And of course, so it's extremely important to stress that scientific aspect of this field. It's just not, uh, I mean, uh, well, it's just not pure gardening. It's not straight and simple gardening, put it that way. There's a lot of you research mean, I that can't, goes I in. I can't put a petunia in the ground and <laughs> water it occasionally and say I'm a horticultural scientist. Well, no, you would be more <laughs> a gardener then. Oh, a yeah, gardener. Exactly, <laughs> yeah. There's a lot but, of but science. But horticultural yeah. science is uh -huh. changing moment by moment. Oh, yeah, there's so much research yeah. going in. I mean, uh -huh. you know, so, it, I mean, to keep up with everything that's going on, there's a lot of reading involved, and there's so many new techniques for propagation, you know. So it's really a, f really a fascinating field. You get to apply all that you have learned, and, you know, for me, because I'm a plant scientist, there's so much I've learned and researched, so I can apply it into this field and make it really exciting for my students. They, they just love to hear what I have to say in class. I'm sure so they I do, but too. I have yeah. to tell you mm -hmm. that I know that, uh, in fact, uh, uh, Lika is from Kerala State in yes. India, yes. and I've been to Cochin, which have is you? part yeah. of, of yeah. the state of Kerala, yeah. and um, I know that it is plenty hot there. That's one <laughs> thing I do know. But I also know yeah. that yeah. you got interested in this field in your parents' rose garden. That's true. You know, when I was about four years old, I think I, think I was about between four and five, I'm sure, mm -hmm. because my mother was pregnant with my sister, so, you know, she's four years younger than me, so it must be around that age. So I think my mother spent a lot of time getting ready for the next pregnant, you know, f for the next baby. So we had a maid at home. You know, she's a stay-at-home maid, and she would take care of everything at home. You know, she's part of the family. So she would do a lot of gardening. So I would just stand there, watch her. You know, she would bring rose cuttings, and she used to put, you know, she used to have this cow dung put on top of the cuttings. And at that time, she didn't know what she was doing, I'm sure. But you it know. was good stuff. But it was good stuff, exactly. <laughs> so I would just stand there and watch her do all that. And I still remember there was one special cutting. She showed me how to cut and everything. She planted it, and it had uh, this beautiful yellow flower after a few weeks. And I, I, that flower is still in my head. I mean, I still love that garden that she, you know, that she had in her backyard. And roses grow so well in India, you know, with all this uh, sunlight and heat. And those cows that keep doing their thing. <laughs> that's, that's right. <laughs> the cows everywhere, you know, holy yeah. cows. So, yeah. 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 So in the, I mean, Kerala is awesome. It's, it's an extremely beautiful state, you it's know. It's beautiful. Yeah, it exactly. It is beautiful. Yeah. I, yeah. I said it's hot, which is true. Which is true, but yeah. It, uh, but with that heat, yeah. it is well worth the trip. Oh, it yeah, is yeah. A I mean, beautiful. Nature. Beautiful. I mean, we have like it 50 is. plus rivers. It is. We have the Western Ghats on this side. Mm -hmm. We have the ocean here and here. And I'm from Trivandrum which is the capital of Kerala. So, you know, ecotourism is great. I mean, uh, there's greenery, there's water, there's backwaters. I think National Geographic has ranked it one of the top um, 10 paradises in the world. Now the Chamber of Commerce will be writing you a, a congratulatory <laughs> letter. <laughs> oh, yeah, of course, yeah. <laughs> That's right. It's a beautiful state. But yeah. I have to say uh -huh. that <coughs> you have come a long way from I have. your mother's yes. rose garden. Yes. And you have, uh, I just picked a few, but you have several pages of scholarly articles yeah. and research that you yeah. have done. So I want to give you full credit for sure. um, a very distinguished career. Thank you. But <coughs> plant science, in some of the public, the magazines that you published in yeah. plant science and, and the Annals of Botany and Gene, capital G, capital E, <laughs> and yeah. E. Yeah. So we can, those are three that I just picked out. Yeah. What, what were the, <coughs> kind of give us a flavor of who you are and what you do. Sure, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, see, the first two articles you mentioned, the, the plant science one and the Annals of Botany, they are for my PhD work. My PhD was at the University of Guelph in Canada, that's Ontario, Canada. And there, the work I did was basically um, um, somatic embryogenesis in alpha-alpha. Oh, so, so now we're talking somatic, about alpha-alpha, but alpha, what are you alpha. doing to it? It is basically cloning. Cloning it, okay. So basically somatic embryogenesis, what that means is 
you are producing embryos from vegetative cells. So, so you pick healthy plants to and duplicate them. Exactly. Okay. From cells, you know, say for example, you have a leaf. Yeah. You can pick a few cells from the yeah. leaf and you can reprogram the cells to make embryos. Mm -hmm. And they are very similar to the seed embryos. So we get a whole bunch of very true, healthy alfalfa true. plants. Yeah, these are true yeah. to type as well. Yeah, they, yeah. They, they're exactly like the parent plant. Do you ever get one that doesn't run true to type? No, no, because no. these are from vegetative cells. Okay. There will be variation, though. Those okay. we call somaclonal variation. So there will be variation. So the first paper in plant science, that was about standardizing conditions for somatic embryogenesis. Now, that's Im so important because to study the real seed, you know, seed development, it's extremely difficult because seeds, you find them, you know, within the fruits and there's tiny, embryos are really tiny, it's extremely difficult. Mm -hmm. But this is done in vitro, in the lab. So the developmental stages of embryogenesis, I can easily look at them, look to see at what stage the, you know, the proteins get accumulated, storage proteins, because if the seed doesn't have all the reserves, mm -hmm. the embryo is not going to be viable. And you can see great grandma right there. <laughs> that's, that's right, yeah, exactly. So, you know, yeah. so, the first, so yeah. the first paper was about standardizing conditions, so the somatic, embryo, somatic embryos uh -huh. would be more or less uh, comparable to the zygotic right. embryos. And of course, keep in mind, the somatic embryos are a good um, um, source for genetic transformation as well. If you want to get the genes in, that's where you begin. That's where you do it. Exactly, yeah. exactly. And the, sec and the second paper was actually done at Holland, at the University of Wageningen. Uh -huh. I did, I did a, so I was an exchange student there. Mm -hmm. Made a lot of friends, worked with Fokert Hoekstra. He's a plant scientist, as well. he's a plant physiologist. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So the, uh, I think it was four or five months in Holland. I just loved that work. It was using, FTIR, that is Fourier transform, infrared spectroscopy to look at the protein folding. Again, if you look at the developmental stages of uh, embryos, they go through a drying phase. And because we are doing this in vitro, if the drying is not done correctly, the membranes could rupture. And then, of course, the, the embryos will not be viable. L let's go well, back a minute. You're talking about proteins. Yes. And yes. you've been talking about proteins a lot. Yeah, yeah. Why is that mm -hmm. so important in mm -hmm. your research? Because it's good point. Yeah. yeah, because when you look at the seed, the seed has all these stored, you know, stored reserves for the mm -hmm. growing embryo. Mm -hmm. Some seeds, like for example, peanuts. Peanuts are so healthy for us because the food they store is a lot of proteins. Now, the em keep in mind these proteins that the em that the seed has is for the developing embryo. So, if all these reserves are not uh, functional, meaning if the embryo is not going to get nourishment from these reserves, the seed is not viable. Do we get nourishment from that protein Oh, oh definitely. <laughs> see. Actually, yeah, legumes are a great yeah. source of nourishment for and us. And see, that is yeah. extremely important <laughs> because yeah. we are trying to feed a population that is growing so fast true. in this world That's so true. that we can't, it's so difficult Very to, important. to produce yeah. enough food. Yeah, and yeah. The, the, yeah exactly. Yeah. It's, ex yeah. it's exceedingly important that we choose the right nutrition in the sense, you know, what is good for us. Yeah. Mix, mixture of cereals and legumes, for example. Yeah. yeah. And the third article, before I forget, is, um, is from um, my postdoc work, um, that, the, you know, the gene article. Uh -huh. <coughs> my postdoc was at Rutgers Ag Biotech Center, that is Biotechnology Center for Agriculture and the Environment. Where is that? Rutgers, New Jersey. Uh -huh. Yeah, so uh, it was an so Rutgers. Yeah, uh -huh. Rutgers, uh -huh. yeah. Uh -huh. That was a great project as well. There what we were trying to do was just study uh, how the fungus, uh, you know, the, the fungi, how they infect plants. So here I had a parasitic fungi, that is the magnopority, that causes summer patch. Summer patch is a common summer, you know, it's a disease yeah. that causes a summer patch, meaning, you know, dead patches of turf. And then I had another one, neotyphodium, and that is a symbiotic fungi. Now, let's go back because <coughs> symbiosis is a very interesting concept yes, yes. because the, the, the fungus can live and the plant can live True. and they both prosper. Exactly. So that's that is, very interesting. Yeah, exactly. Uh -huh. that's, that is so important because, you know, the golf industry has a bad reputation for spraying a lot of chemicals. Exactly. But they're trying not to do that. And they, they actually uh, funded quite a bit of this research because what they were hoping for is to have more of these endophytic fungi colonized turf. And why is that important? It's so important because these endophytes actually, they synthesize certain compounds, alkaloids actually. Uh, and these compounds, these alkaloids, they actually confer ins insect resistance. So if these compounds are in, in the grass, they will not get, um, you know, um, um, insect attacks in the sense uh, they get insect, uh, they, they more or less act like insect repellents, meaning they will not Are get they binders? No, 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 they're, they're not just, binders. No, no, they're just absolutely symbiotic. Yeah, 
Exactly. Growth. Yeah, uh -huh. absolutely symbiotic growth, and these compounds confer insect resistance, herbivore resistance, drought tolerance, stress tolerance. So the golf industry can really reduce the amount of pesticides they apply. Well, I have to tell you that's very good news because there are an awful lot of golfers <laughs> in Johnson County. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they're, you know, they're working yeah. hard to get yeah. the perfect turf without having to spray all these chemicals. And this, if, if, if they can, you know, if we can really understand how this uh, endophytic fungi colonize, then of course, you know, we, we can have more of this acrimonium, uh, sorry, this neotyphodium group infect, and then of course, you know, they will have this natural inbuilt resistance in them. So it's great research, I thought. Yeah. But and it and it grows daily <coughs> because new finds are being finds are being found. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I mean, yeah. But, it's a great, and this yeah. is a good segue into something else that I want to talk to sure, you about, yeah. and that is uh, plant propagation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I know that you know your your roses they propagate yeah, yeah, it. I mean, yeah. you can always go back to those roses oh, yeah. because roses, plant yeah. propagation. Yeah. But the plant <coughs> propagation in Food, food yeah. is really, I think, the major issue true, in, true. in this yeah. science of horticulture. Yeah. And what's new in plant propagation that would help feed the world? Yeah, particularly, you know, uh, plant propagation. I mean, that whole industry has advanced so much the last 20, 30 years. I mean, new techniques. True, we have the seeds. You know, every, everybody likes to start from seeds, but but for the horticulturists, we always like the vegetative aspect, meaning vegetative propagation. You know, we like. Uh, like taking know, cuttings. cuttings, yeah, yeah. cuttings, yeah. leaf cuttings, uh -huh. stem uh -huh. cuttings. You know, we have uh -huh. suckers, slips. The list goes on and on yeah. and on. Yeah. But nowadays, tissue culture is huge. You know, tissue culture means now can you plant tissue culture? Plant tissue culture, yeah. uh -huh. exactly. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. You take small pieces of tissue, and then of course, you know, depending on what you want from it, meaning do you want embryos, do you want organs? You can program. You know, you can you can have the media in such a way that the growth regulators control that. So that is huge. A lot of nurseries these days, like the QNZ, Hoster Nursery in Chicago exclusively tissue culture so there's a huge demand for that all they do is tissue culture all they do is hosta tissue culture yeah for, exactly and and <coughs> they can order tissue cultures from and them. we do that yeah, yeah, yeah for the yeah. hot club what we do is we order plugs and these plugs come like the you know small and mm -hmm. these are tissue cultured hostas mm -hmm. and they will always be true to type there will be no variation at all is there so some particular reason you use hostas no no I mean um, for the hot club, we order so many plants. I mean, we yeah, order yeah. a lot of plants. Yeah. Hostas, oh, oh, so, oh, cells, you know, oh, people I, love uh, hostas. Yeah, I do too. You, you do too. That's the reason I was asking you. Yeah, yeah I do. I mean, so, uh, so tissue culture is huge. Yeah. Then, of course, hydroponics is huge. And then, you know, so, so, so recently I went for a conference in Arizona, University of Arizona. It was uh, CEAC, that is a Controlled Environment Agricultural Center. There was so much emphasis in hydroponics, and I, I was, you know, surprised that there's hydroponics done commercially to that extent. They're even combining aquaculture, which is growing fishes, yeah. with hydroponics. It's called aquaponics, so that is huge. But now I want to pull out a phrase here, <coughs> and that is controlled environment. Yes, yes. What, what, how do you, is it a building? It's greenhouses, basically. You know, they so it doesn't have to be concrete walls. It doesn't, no, it doesn't have to be concrete. See, walls. I think that's important yeah, because yeah. in underdeveloped countries, mm -hmm. they can use he, uh, high, heavy grade plastic. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. and that's important. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, in see, the university I studied, we had, you know, huge greenhouses as well. Depending on the, you know, depending on the environment, you can have different kinds of structures, you know, mm -hmm. closed, semi closed, that goes on and on and on. But they can be, they can vary, depend on the climate, depend on the area, oh, yeah, depend on yeah, the. Yeah. Uh, expertise of the people yeah. that are doing it. So that's really important. Oh, very important. So yeah. <laughs> this closed environment, this hydroponic uh, mm -hmm. gardening yeah. is not a curiosity. Oh, no, no, not anymore. It, it used, used to be. be. It used to be, exactly, yeah. 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 My students still like to do it on a small scale. Yeah, it used to be a curiosity, but now it's done a lot, you know, large scale. Mm -hmm. In answer to your question about food crops, you know, uh, I mean, there are a lot of new introduced varieties, you know, these days, a lot of plant breeding still. Uh, peop I mean, see, breeding is still very effective, you know, uh, but breeding takes time. But still a lot of the new cultivars, new varieties of rice, wheat, sorghum, corn, they all come out of plant breeding. And of course you have transgenic, meaning genetically transformed varieties as well. To give you a good example, the Green Revolution in India, for example, 70s, you know, everything that was introduced, you know, high yielding rice, high yielding wheat, you know, so th there are a lot of new varieties coming out. To, you know, to adapt to the situations, to different growing conditions, rather. I want to yeah. pull out another couple of phrases that sure. you use. One is genetically transformed, sure. and the yeah. other is irradiated. Uh -huh. And those two issues do cause some conversation. Yes, they do. Why? You know, genetic engineering, I mean, um, has done a lot, has done a lot of good, actually, for the ag industry. 
agricultural industry has really benefited from genetic engineering in terms of high productivity, in terms of improved nourishment, in terms of reduced pesticide use, uh, in terms of reduced tilling, you know, and in terms of reduced fuel use, because reduced tillage means reduced fuel use as well. Several good examples of biotech, uh, of ag biotech, in the sense, um, transgenic plants. Bt corn. I mean, if, if, if the Bt gene was not introduced into corn, we would be spending billions of dollars. I mean, annual loss before Bt, you know, Bt corn was introduced was a billion dollar every year. You know, so Bt corn is a good example. Billion dollars for what? To get rid of the? The European corn borer. Yeah, oh, the corn borer. Corn yeah. borer, exactly. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. That, that yeah. was a serious pest problem. Yeah. And since Bt corn was introduced. They don't like it. They don't like it because, yeah, because, you know, Bt is actually a soil-borne bacterium. Yeah. It has got, uh, you know, uh, certain proteins, of course, will rupture the, the gut. That's mm -hmm. how the caterpillars are killed. So we so fix those boys. <laughs> that, that's right. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, I mean, you know, yeah. yeah. So there are several more good examples. Herbicide-resistant yeah. yeah. soybean, canola. I mean, the list is endless. But true, beet, uh, I mean, true transgenics are controversial. You're absolutely right. Mm. And uh, the main reason is be because of the horizontal gene transfer, you know, that means you're bringing in genes from unrelated species, you know, yeah. and that's a concern. But I think, <coughs> too, mm -hmm. uh, Lika, that uh -huh. often we fear what we don't understand. That is so true, yeah. That's and I, that's yeah. why I love to do these yes. kinds of things, yes. because uh, we can talk to the neighbors about <laughs> things that, well, that they eat every day. Exactly, And yeah. that they may not um, quite understand, and somebody like you can um, shed the light on the subject and make it okay. Yeah, exactly. I mean, there is risk in everything. You know, you got to evaluate the risks in the sense uh, yeah. pros, cons. Yeah. You know, got to weigh, weigh it out and see what works better. Yeah. So, genetic engineering has been good for the ag industry, but then, of course, the concern is the horizontal gene transfer, meaning mm -hmm. bringing in gene from bacteria to plants. Mm -hmm. But that has happened in nature. That's yeah. nothing new. Yeah. I mean, if you look at the, say, for example, one of the vectors. What, or one of the ways we get the foreign gene into the system mm -hmm. is using a certain bacteria called agrobacterium. And agrobacterium is actually a soil-borne bacterium. It does exist in nature. Mm -hmm. it, it actually infects the plants and causes the tumors, you know, the galls you see. The galls, yes. The, exactly, yeah. and what it does is when it infects, yeah. uh, in the plasmid region, there's a certain part of the DNA that has, um, you know, a region which, uh, which will actually um, give cytokinins. What that means is growth regulators. Yeah. So when it infects, it will incorporate that part of the plasmid into the host DNA, the plant DNA. And that's not that, a good that, thing. That will keep the cells. That will keep the cells multiplying. Yeah. So even if you cut yeah. off the gall, the cells will still keep, you know, still still Those keep multiplying. They sneaked in there. But exactly. you know, the woodworkers yeah. out there will understand galls because a lot of woodworkers like to use those galls beautiful to art. beautiful, yes, yes. Uh, you know, yes. patterns in the wood. Exactly. So, so, th so yeah. this cross transfer has happened. In, yeah. Does happen in nature. Yeah. You know, so it's nothing new. So I think you know that there, there are risks in every procedure, in everything we do evaluate the risks and take it from there. Yeah. And it, it's just because it's a bacteria, it's not necessarily a bad guy. No, I mean, you know, yeah. uh, there could be viruses, you yeah. know. Yes. <laughs> like we eat a yeah. whole lot of stuff. Yeah. We don't yeah, exactly. So yeah. you got to research more and see, you know, what works I want to switch from mm -hmm. the seeds to the medium sure. in which yeah. it grows. Uh -huh. And I know mm -hmm. that Kansas particularly, um, the aquifer is beginning uh -huh. to dry up. Yeah, Water yeah, is yeah, a major, yeah. mm -hmm. a major problem, yeah. not only in Kansas, but in many Everywhere. parts of the yeah. world. Um, hot, dry, arid, yes. water drying up. Yes. And the other problem is worn out and poor <coughs> soil. So what do you, what does um, horticultural sciences have to say about the, particularly worn out and poor soil? Because particularly in the third world countries of the world, uh, and fertilizer is not always good either. No, no, too much fertilizing yeah, is not yeah. good. You've got to yeah. limit, it's too much fertilizing, what it does is, of course, plants can only absorb so much. So the excess nitrates and phosphates, they all get leached out, they all get washed off, you know. In our drinking water sometimes. Into the surface, yeah, right. exactly, into That's all right. these aquatic ecosystems, yeah, like your lakes, yeah. ponds, everything. And there it causes something called eutrophication. What it means is, what is good for the plants is good for the algae as well, right? So all these nitrates and phosphates will cause this algae to, to really grow well, that's well and why bloom. These, so many of these ponds are so full of this Scum. green stuff exactly. and exactly. duckweed and exactly. all of this. Yes, yes, yes. exactly. Yeah. And that, yeah. of course, will cut off light to the lower layers. I mean, all these native fishes are dying from that because mm -hmm. no light. And of course, when these algae start rotting, mm -hmm. they take up all the oxygen, which means less oxygen in the water. So that causes a lot of problems. So you do not want to be applying excess fertilizers. What is the best fertilizer to use that's best for the environment, the fish, and the 
and the algae don't get a free meal. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I really like organic food. You know, see anything organic, they have very little NPK, meaning the nutrients are very little. And I also like the slow release forms. You know, and what is organic fertilizer made from? Basically, is it a, a laboratory kinds. created or oh, no, is it no, 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 or even compost? Com I love okay. compost. Okay. In my garden, I use a lot of compost. You know. And I buy it from Missouri Organics, and I use it. And I also like Osmocote, a very slow-release fertilizer. I use Depending that. on the temperature, I use, use that. that. Yeah. yeah, I love that. Slow-release temperature. It's temperature and water-dependent, so there's no ex you know, excess wash-off. So coming back to your question about what to do about um, you know, the dry, arid uh, regions, in India, for example, there is ICRISAT. ICRISAT is the International Crop Research Institute for Semi-Arid Tropics. ICRISAT has done a lot of fantastic research, and they have introduced a lot of wheat, uh, sorghum, you know, peanuts, mm -hmm. all of these uh, are ideal for hot, you know, arid climates. Here, for example, there is the Land Institute in Salina, Kansas. Actually, Dr. Wes Jackson, he came and gave a talk here recently. And they are, they are trying to, there's a push for having more perennials. Perennials? Perennial wheat. Yeah, exactly. Perennial, perennial wheat. wheat. Really? Yeah, exactly. That's and they are And they are doing a lot of good research in that field. They're trying to have perennial wheat, perennial sorghum, and, and not these, corn though. Uh, see, corn, he did not talk about corn, but there's so much corn grown here, I'm sure corn would be an ideal mm. uh, candidate too. Mm. If, if you look at corn, for example, if you look at the ancestor of corn, it's a weed in Mexico, it's teosinte. Yeah. Teosinte is basically a weed in Mexico. Yeah. So corn has been bred so many generations that the modern day corn. Which we often don't realize. We don't realize no, that, yeah, exactly. Yeah. It, does, it looks nothing like the teosinte. Yeah. It's a heavy feeder, it needs a lot of nitrogen, needs a lot of water. But I think the pushes for perennials with the extensive deep root system like the prairie grasses do, so that way they will go search for water. You don't have to constantly water. But that's good for the for the aquifer too. Exactly. Up. So the Ogallala aquifer. I mean, it's just drying up so fast, and these aquifers, they, you know, they yeah. don't form overnight. Yeah, yeah. It takes millions of years, you know, for these. We're not going to live that long, Lika. No, <laughs> I know, and they're not exactly. <laughs> that's what you know. The recharging rate is that's so right. slow. Yeah. I mean. I've been talking about this freshwater shortage. I mean, that will happen. You know, another thing is when I visited some of these islands for my recent vacation, we went to six Caribbean islands, Dominica, Barbados, all of those islands. And one thing they all mentioned was when they have, you know, when they construct buildings, in their building plans, they have to have something for harvesting rainwater. Mm -hmm. Because in those islands, it's an acute shortage of freshwater. So they collect rainwater, they store it above ground, below ground, whatever works for them. But Unless they have something for that, their building permits will never well, be approved. And to make fresh water out of salt water is extremely oh, expensive. Exa and they don't extremely. taste as good either. It doesn't taste as good either, no, you know. But it may do for watering, but yeah. it's extremely expensive. Yeah. So they try to stay away from that if they possibly can. True, exactly. Can. Yeah. Another thing is the native plant, you know, people are moving towards, mo mo yeah. you know, more towards n native plants. That's excellent. I mean, there are so many, you know, native plants you can incorporate into your gardening well, if you're a horticulturist. Well, boy, I'm for perennials. I am yeah. saving myself work if yeah. I possibly can. Yeah, and, so and you know, K-State, uh, you know, they, they have a very good website, extension website. Uh -huh. uh, it's called Prairie Star and Prairie Bloom. They have a list of all the plants, annuals and perennials, that do exceedingly well in Kansas heat. And so dry. Sorry? And dry as well. And dry, exactly. Yeah, uh -huh. Exactly. Kansas uh -huh. heat and, and this uh -huh. dry, you know, dry yeah. climate. So if you go to their website, you can get, they, uh, they do field trials. I think some are tested for three years, some for five years, and they have a complete list of all the plants. So it's Prairie Bloom. Uh huh. And what's the other one? It's, uh, it's Prairie Bloom and Prairie Star. Okay. Yeah. To, I mean, because I, I think there, you can just some Google folks that. out there will want to yeah. check those. Oh yeah, they have. Yeah. I mean, the, and they even have a list of retailers who carry these plants. Oh, that's good. Yeah, that's I mean, so many cultivars. I mean, if you look at the list, you have so many choices. Yeah. You know, I want to make another move from the medium in which the plants are grown sure, yeah. to the pesticides sure. that we use yeah. on plants, uh -huh. and I think that is a hugely dangerous. Um, it can be good, but we have gotten to the point with pesticides where some of them are just really highly toxic. Yeah, yeah, true. And that's what we talk about in class. We always discuss integrated pest management, IPM. It's just basically some common sense techniques put together. It's just what it means is, see, we, see it's not about use, not using chemicals. Of course, you know, sometimes that's uh, that will be the only choice. And that will be the, I mean, uh, put it this way. IPM is all about using several methods for controlling, not for controlling, but for regulating the pest population. Meaning, 
uh, say for example, just uh, spring clean, uh, f fall cleanup, spring cleanup, you know, just sanitation. We could be loaded up with ladybugs. <laughs> there, there we go. That's biological control. Again, that's yep. part of IPM. So sanitation, you know, so cultural methods, uh, biological control, and there are so many good biological control agents. Like you mentioned, the ladybug, you know, like Copert, for example, they sell biological control agents. My mother used to throw soapy water. Soapy water works, you know, like yeah. for some of the sucking insects, soapy water works. When I was a student, you know, we used to, um, you know, try different things and tobacco decaution used to work, you know. So there's so many other things you could do. Yeah. You don't al always have to use chemicals. And if you have to use chemicals, my recommendation would be to use one. I mean, there's so many groups of pesticides, you know, you have uh, organophosphates, you have different groups. Use one that does not l persist in the environment for too long a time. Because well, the short, with well, a short life, exactly, yeah. Ex very good. Yeah. The residual toxicity should be low, meaning you do not want to kill the non-target species. So look at all M the options, meaning us, <laughs> <laughs> including us, exactly. You know, all the bees and the you know right. the animals and the plants yeah. we love and the insects we love. We don't want to be you know. Be well, the bees are having a problem too, but that's a subject for exactly. another day. Yeah, but I feel yeah. so sorry. You know, so it's sorry a for terrible. Them. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, terrible yeah. thing. So, um, the future. Uh huh. Um, what sort of plant projects or what do you envision the future? I mean, to me, it is a, a huge explosion, uh, the future in, yeah. as, as far as plant science goes. True. Yeah. Well, what's happening? What, what, what is your next research yeah. project? Good question, actually. I, you know, I, I, I do so, sometimes think about, um, you know, what's the next direction to, t to take my, um, you know, my interest, basically my knowledge in. And so, Several options. We have a speaker coming from the University of Arizona. Let's uh, call in residence program. So he'll be coming in October, and he will be talking about greenhouse uh, structures, engineering aspects, uh, mechanization, computerization, all of that. So, I've, uh, and he is, you know, like uh, that, that whole CEA, you know, he's from CEAC, that's a Controlled Environment Agricultural Center. That, that we were talking about with the hydroponics, hydroponics and the fish farming. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. And that is a huge, I mean, you know, I, I recently heard Tim Blank, uh, he's from Future Growing, he's a consultant with them, and he was showing us uh, PowerPoints of these uh, million dollar projects they're doing on restaurant rooftops, hydroponics one side, aquaculture this side, water from aquaculture is getting used for hydroponics. And, it, and that is huge because you know people coming to to the restaurants, they like to go up and see how where the fish grow, where the herbs, tomatoes, well, everything. But comes let's from. go back a minute. If we can reuse the water mm -hmm. to grow the plants, to, to feed the fish, yes. to um, water the grass, whatever we have to yes. do. But reuse of our resources yes. is, I mean, that's really what we're talking about. Exactly. Here. And actually, there is a you know if you go to the Missouri, you know the Missouri. Uh, Department of Conservation, the Discovery Center, mm -hmm. the Anita D. Gorman, Dis you know, Discovery Center on Troost. They have a setup there. They was, sh the, you know, I'm not sure if it's still there, but I used to take my class there because I used to work closely with the Conservation mm -hmm. Department. Mm -hmm. uh, they have a setup where they recycle, of, or rather they reuse uh -huh. sewage water, you know, yeah, the, the, the water from the toilets. Yeah. It finally, of course, they have s several systems by which the water gets sure. purified and it goes into the wetlands. But again, yeah, we've got, to, we've got to make sure we don't waste water. Mulch your plants if we have to, you know, have collect rainwater, you know, and adopt the best but, management practices. But don't you practices. think what we're really yeah. talking about in all of the subjects, yeah. we're talking about maximizing the efficiency of the crop, it's We're all talking about yes. feeding the world, yes. which feeding is the, extremely ex difficult. Exactly, with the population crisis. We are talking yes. about the best use of the resources we yeah. have. Maximize, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And it's all about sustainable ag, yeah. sustainable hot. We should not be depleting yeah. our resources, you know, and that's very important. So anyway, so this speaker will be coming and, uh, you know, we'll be, uh, hope, I hope to collaborate with him. The other thing is ag biotech, like we were talking about genetic engineering. We actually, um, JCCC actually, science department, we put in a grant with K-State uh, and Manhattan Area Technical College um, to develop an, a biote ag biotech curriculum. Mm -hmm. So we'll be offering uh, classes at K-State. So but isn't that the wonderful part about the Johnson County Community yes. College? It's the, the cooperation True. with all of the other schools, not only in the state of Kansas, but in our area mm -hmm. that do something like what we do mm -hmm. and we share information yes. we share the brains and the ability yeah. and the yeah. and the education yes. of our faculty yeah. and as i say thank you so much thank to you. dr lika shridhar associate professor of horticultural sciences <laughs> I really enjoyed at johnson to county you. community college yeah. i would tell you that we're so happy to have had you today and we want you to come back soon because we have a lot 
of sure. neighbors in our community that you would like to meet. I'm Mary Davidson. This is Dr. Sridhar, and thank you for being with us. It's been a pleasure, Lika. Thank you. Thank you.